before I do the official welcome, this is the health warning to everybody on the Zoom that just the main part, not the discussion, will be recorded. So uh, if you, we do have it spotlighted on the room and uh, rather the presentation actually um, for the recording on, on YouTube. Um, but if you want to be extra sure, then just turn up your camera. Um, okay. And with that, I think we ready to go. So welcome to our final seminar um, on World Christianity this term, which is run together with the uh, Faculty of Divinity and the Cambridge Center for Christianity Worldwide. My name is Jörg Kostein, I'm Associate Professor of World Christianities here. And it is my great pleasure to welcome Dr. Priscilla Garcia here today, who did her PhD here in Cambridge on Pentecostals in Brazil and is now a, a, a research and teaching associate of the Department of Anthropology here in Cambridge as well. Um, and I think this ties in very neatly to a seminar we had two seminars ago, which was also about Brazil, politics, and Pentecostals, and whether Pentecostalism is even anything useful to say anymore as a category and how the politics of Pentecostals works. And if I interpret your talk topic right, and also our previous conversations, you will actually unpack some of those questions for us today. So I'm very excited to hear what you have to, what you will present, and look forward to your paper and the discussion. Welcome, Priscilla. All right, great. So hello, everybody. Uh, thanks, Jorg, for inviting me to be here to share my research with you. This is uh, great. So, and thanks for being here. It's the last week of term, so I know everybody's tired. So hopefully this is, this is uh, something we can talk about uh, later on. Yes. So uh, whenever I tell my friends and colleagues about my research and share stories about the pastor president of Advec Church in Brazil, they ask how much the pastor influences in leaders' votes and more importantly, the Brazilian law. Their curiosity stems from the most part from the assumption that politics and religion should be kept apart. While this reasoning is quite familiar in the West and has animated a long tradition of debates within political philosophy and the social sciences, the problem is far more layered on the other side of the Atlantic. It's made up of three elements that are constitutive of the predic predicament I'm laying out here. The first one is the symbiotic relationship between right-wing politicians and Pentecostal leaders in the Americas, which has become a decisive element in the rise of power of many conservative leaders more recently in the region. Beside a few, Donald Trump, of course, in the States, Macri in Argentina, Bukele in El Salvador, and of course, Jair Bolsonaro in Brazil. And the list goes on. The emergence of the so-called conservative wave has mobilized a range of sensibilities, including within academia. Soon debates on the relationship between religion and politics, namely the debates over the implications of evangelical activism for democracy, democracy has gained tra traction. Se the second trust of my uh, um, strand of my argument here um, comes from the academic literature on Pentecostalism and politics produced in and about Latin America. When Pentecostalism exploded in the region around the 1970s and became politically, politically engaged in the 1980s and 90s, this literature's main debate revolved around the question on how democratic Pentecostalism was and whether the church has helped to develop democratic consciousness or whether they curtailed it. This framework was developed to try to understand Pentecostalism's acute appear to the core in view of liberation theology. The final strand is a predicament that today's secular modern state has emerged through the succession of disentanglements between the religions, political and economic orders, which is now an axiom. In anthropology, it served in the past as a definite, def defining attribute between societies roughly classified in two groups. The West, home of the anthropologist, where social, the social order was thought to be disembedded, and that is with clear boundaries between political, economic, and religious spheres, and the rest, to put in Seward Hall's terms, home of the exotic order, whose social order was thought to be markedly different from, for its entangled nature in mixing religion, politics, and the economic order as total social facts. Although anthropology has come a long way in problematizing the artificial divisions within, with the dimensions of religion and politics, there are still some problems one encounters when studying the political involvement of Pentecostals. On the one hand, theoretical divisions within anthropology have made politics to be mostly about people's relationship with the state, 
despite a brief period of, period of processual theory within political anthropology, which made aiding driven in local politics the focus of inquiry. So, but when we probe more specifically onto the relationship between religion, politics, and ethics, the division becomes even sharper. In a lecture published under the title Troubled Waters at the Confluence of Ethics and Politics, Didier Fazan argued that anthropologists, similarly to philosophers, carved out moral principles and dilemmas from other realms of social life in an attempt to purify the ethical domain from other dimensions of human action that are empirically normatively impure. However, as he posited, the two can't be completely separated when it comes to studying people's motivations to undertake political action. The other the theoretical methodological problem comes from anthropology Christianity itself and the study of political life of Christians. One of them is that the theological concepts such as the kingdom of God and its potential ethical political implications, for example, have not been comparatively discussed in the context of various forms of Christian political life. Yet the articulation between ethics and politics certainly appears in the ethnographic context studies, for example. So I'll, I'll just cite three main um, works, which is uh, Omri Lisha um, in the United States, Kevin O'Neill in Guatemala, and Ruth Marshall in Nigeria, all because these are all mega churches. Um, so very compared to the, um, the case I'm doing here. The second tenet of my argument is an initial attempt to propose a solution to the problem I just presented here by analyzing political Pentecostalism through the concept of the kingdom of God. This, in fact, is, a connected, is a connected with a larger methodological concept that I tentatively call a radical anthropology of Christianity for itself. I won't have the time to discuss what I mean by this concept here, but in a nutshell, it takes the successful concept of Christianity for itself, first established by Joe Robbins as a comparative project on Christianity as a cultural formation, and marries it with a critical approach that seeks to undergird and bring to the fore the unseen and tacit categories of Christian cultures that are specific to historical formations. The comparative project, which is at the kernel of the anthropology of Christianity, I argue, should not only be undertaken as a comparison between practice locations and engagements uh, only. So, for example, what Christians uh, do in regards to the political or the economic or into religious coexistence and so on, but should also mean um, that a comparison between theological concepts or, on how Christians see the world to be fundamental categories of existence of their religious, political, and ethical lives. Concepts like God, Jesus, sin, salvation, evil, the kingdom of God, hell, and love are at the heart of Christian theology. Yet, we still seem to bracket these important concepts when we translate them into more perhaps academically accepted concepts at the risk of reducing them to merely heuristic tools. Instead, I ask, what would happen if we did not translate these concepts, but let them help us construct our theoretical models? As you can see, we have a very complex problem and somewhat ambitious project in front of us, um, one that certainly exceeds the time of this, this talk. Um, but I hope I have laid out this far some um, context to my argument. Um, and of course, I hope to keep you entertained for the next 40 minutes. Mm -hmm. So um, my argument actually goes uh, in two parts. It's twofold, so it goes like this. So first, the kingdom of God is centered by that Christianity and shapes the ethical, political life of these Pentecostal Christians mm -hmm. through a paramount value I call building the kingdom. And two, this Christian category can amplify some theoretical horizons, affording questions about the relationship between religion, ethics, and politics to be displaced from traditional modes of inquiry, and therefore to be found in expected, unexpected ways where we didn't um, see it would be possible. So the next session is section here is titled um, Reframing Politics from and for Advec. So I tied this session, this section this way because I hope, as I hope to make clear, the political formation that I have encountered at Advex extrapolates traditional forms of politics that are often explored by political anthropologists, namely grassroots political activism and the state. For as much as I wish to claim this was a purely intellectual enterprise, I must admit this was 
really out of necessity. <laughs> and this is so because I couldn't, I had to understand first what politics is from an Adbeck's perspective, and then explain what politics means for Adbeck Christians. But first things first, the Assembly of God, Victory in Christ Church, popularly known as Advec, is a Pentecostal denomination from Brazil that has more than 50,000 members. It comprises one over 100 churches spread, spread across 10 states and abroad. The church's headquarters were carried out 16 months of fieldwork is the oldest and largest church within the denomination. It has approximately 6,000 members alone. It sits in the vibrant and yet impoverished, impoverished neighborhood, surrounded um, by one of uh, Rio's sort of most violent um, slums. Mm -hmm. To an outside observer, Advec embodies the perfect example of a politicized church. It epitomizes what Jose Casanova terms political religions and what the literature in the coming together religion politics has been documented in the last 40 years or so in various parts of the world. Led by Brazil's most influential evangelical leaders, Pastor Silas Malafaia, who's up here, um, Advec became highly influential in the early 2010s when Silas rose to the church presidency and his political influence began to be widely discussed in the media. The growing interest in the past is twofold. On the one hand, he has not only shown a considerable capacity to mobilize his church to vote for politicians he supports, but he also emerged as a prominent religious leader who can mobilize the Brazilian Pentecostal community as a whole. Pastor Silas considers himself as a prophetic voice whose duty is to lead, educate, influence, and influence the Pentecostal community according to what he terms are innegotiable biblical values. This includes spreading his controversial views on homosexuality, abortion, freedom of speech, corruption, and legalization of drugs among, among believers and in the public sphere. His prophetic duty also includes providing believers with instruction on how and for whom to vote while fostering close ties with politicians across all spheres of power. One example of this is Pastor Silas' influence in the Brazilian parliament and the friendship he sustains with former President Bolsonaro. In accordance with what I am describing here, um, when I first visited the ADVEC in 2014, Brazil was about to undergo a very disputed presidential election. The church was quite energized about the topic. A fasting campaign was launched Prayer meetings for the nation were held, and Pastor Silas gave a two hour long speech, uh, sorry, sermon entitled uh, Christians, in, uh, Christians in Politics, in which he argued that voting uh, in the national elections was an important opportunity to uh, the exercise of one's Christianity in the world. When I returned to Advec two years later, this time for my long field work, Brazil was undergoing a deeper political and economic crisis. This predicament began a few years before with protests and riots emerging in various cities, which led to the impeachment of then President Dilma Rousseff on 31st August mm -hmm. and of 2016. And here's a glance of the data. So this is kind of a more ethnographic, so I hope you enjoy this. Um, on, on that morning, the streets surrounding um, Advent embodied the tension in the air as Brazil braced to hear a verdict on the fate of the president, Dilma Rousseff. I left home soon after 7 a.m. to observe the streets while headed to the church. As I walked, I could hear the news from the TVs inside bakeries and cafes announcing the Senate is voting today for after a long eight month process against President Dilma. The impeachment of the president seems inevitable. I stopped by a newsstand. Similar headlines printed in big letters com competed for space on the front page with the president's photo. It's over for, for Gilma, says one of them. The anxiety of the streets that morning, which had been building up since the beginning of the week when Gilma's judgment started, filled me with high expectations and curiosity for what I was about to encounter at Advec. Believing in the trope of Advec being a politicized church, my natural inclination was to think that the church was bo bo uh, boozing that day. But to my surprise, this was not the case. As with any typical Wednesday, 
things at Advec were slower than other days of the week. The church was holding its morning prayer meeting, which was mostly attended by middle-aged women. Low-ranking pastors held off hours in their rooms, and church departments worked as normal. I headed straight to the office of the Department for the Integration of New Converts to observe the activities. Pastor Rogério, the department's coordinator, greeted me quickly. He was working hard with his volunteer assistants, hoping to finish a midterm conversion and baptism report. That was to be submitted to Advec's leading pastor later that evening. While he typed the report, on the radio on the corner of his desk, the news of Dilma Rousseff's impeachment echoed low. Pastor Rogério, every now and then, would stop and listen. But a few seconds later, would return to what seemed to be a much more important matter, his work on the conversion reports, uh, conversion and baptism reports. The president failed the day, but Advec kept going. The reports were submitted on time, and preparations for the upcoming conference, church conference progressed as normal. As the day-to-day -day life of Advec Christians became my own, the militant church I expected to encounter was nowhere to be found. Rather, Advec believers were much more motivated to organize and participate in church events like Women's National Conference, um, special church services led by famous pastors, theology courses, or to develop their own personal ministries of singing, preaching, and so on. This is not to say, however, that they were not concerned with political issues, but their, but their political model is best described as an ethical political articulation I call building the kingdom. And the next session is a uh, section is called um, On the Kingdom of God and Building the Kingdom. Throughout my field work at ADVEC, I spent a considerable amount of time in classrooms taking courses. As a newcomer, I was encouraged to take new, the new converts course to learn the basics. As an anthropologist, I decided to progress as if a newly converted, as I had been a newly converted Pentecostal. I first began taking classes for new converts, then attended the baptism preparation course, and finally took a six months, a six month Sunday course designed for new church members before proceeding to join the entire church community in their Sunday Bible study. I often, often heard from my Advec teachers a phrase that represents well the idea of building the kingdom of God. It goes like this. As Christians, we are not from the world. We are here in the world to transform the world. Oriented through what Birgit Mayer describes as cosmolo a cosmology of world making, Advec Pentecostals understand themselves as, a, as tripartite beings, that is, made of body, soul, and spirit, who, like any other human being, have been created by God with the purpose to implement the kingdom of God in the world. To assist people with this project, Advec believers understand that God has distributed uniquely personal gifts and talents that are to be developed as individual ministries at the church for the sake of the church. These ministries are mostly the kinds of work people usually take up in Christian churches around the world, such as helping services, becoming a pastor or singing, engaging in evangelization work and so on. However, at that back, ministries are not limited to traditional forms of church work, but are generally understood as a calling people have that may help them to infuse the world with Christian values and attract others to Christianity. Ministries can include any professional vocations, especially those which have weight in social, political, educational, and judicial spheres. Activities carried in, out in these environments, which are considered by believers to be hostile to Christians and the Christian faith, are also highly valuable in performance. This includes, for example, attending university and working among, among or for non-believers. The most Expressive case here is certainly the public and political role embraced by Pastor Silas as a prophetic voice and Pentecostal leader of Brazil. But take, for example, the case of my friends Gabi and Manu, living um, in one of the most violent stricken uh, slums in Rio. Rio, they um, were some of the many students whose university you know, university tuition fees were paid by Advec. Manu was a law major, while Gabi studied psychology. They were studying, as they put it, to make a difference in the world as professionals of the kingdom. Manu chose to study law to become a judge 
to hoping to prevent children from getting adopted by gay couples. Gabi saw in the prospect of becoming a clinical psychologist, the possibility of providing care and evangelizing others through her practice. In this way, believers who spend most of their time working amongst non-believers often ask themselves whether they are being were being good examples for fellow workers and family members. The majority of them try to try to exhibit a good, good Christian attitude that is compromised of acts of benevolence, respect for hierarchy, obedience, and resilience. They are meant to inspire and attract the curiosity of non-believers about their distinctively virtuous attitudes. They often seek, uh, sought to fashion their behavior as a strategy to attract new believers in view of employing traditional non traditionally known forms of proselytism. They are often received with great distaste by a good portion of Brazilians. Part of these rejections, believe, believers think, is exacerbated by the fact that they have ties with Pastor Silas. And there, therefore, they believe new strategies for evangelizing were needed. As a result, even activities as trivial as brewing coffee for co-workers could be considered as a form of building God's kingdom. Building the kingdom is, at least in principle, not necessarily about what one does. So it's not about the activity, but it's about the commitment to doing it. I call building the kingdom the analytical term I use to describe the paramount value that shapes the ethical and political undertakings of Advent believers as, as they seek to transform the world and themselves at the church and beyond. This is, particular, this is a particular kind of value that articulates ethics and politics via a Pentecostal definition of the kingdom of God. Drawing from the work of Widmond, uh, I consider values as, com as a, a set of common elements that are shared in a given society, enabling both individual and collective categories to shape social life and people's experiences. Among these categories, um, the most important one is certainly the idea of God's kingdom. In, some, in a somewhat uh, similar fashion to the Augustine interpretation of the kingdom of God, Advent Pentecostals conceived it as a divine order that permeates all existence. Yet, as, um, as a perfect divine order, the kingdom of God is never completely realized in earthly life. Um, only imperfect versions of it. And this is why it must be constantly brought upon and be built. God's kingdom needs to be, needs to keep growing and it needs to perfect itself. As Antonia, my closest friend from Advec told me once, this is the work that Jesus depends and count on us to do. Building the kingdom informs what Advec believers are trying to create as well as what they're trying to control. I hope I have provided um, so far a uh, good enough of an outline of Advec's notion of the kingdom of God and how this infuses their cultural model of Christian Christianity through the value I call building the kingdom. This cultural model can be easily interpreted as a form of religious ethics. Believers are compelled to act in the world to transform it through God-given talents and ministries. It's a God-given te teleological project, but things are far less simple than it seems. So let me direct the discussion now towards politics. In an essay published in the early 1970s and in his last book published in the 1990s, Louis Dumont presented his political thought. In the essay, he argued that politics is not a universal category and therefore should not be generalized. In the book, he expands on this thought, arguing that anthropologists should take politics comparatively because um, of the intrinsic connections between politics and cultural values. In this way, some societies will express unity by invoking the principles of general will through traditional secularized political forms. Others, on the other hand, will do so, will do so through religion. In the case of Advec, what we have is a religion which expresses collective vision through the unity of the church as a manifestation of the kingdom of God. This is not to say that the Advec Christians do not hold the concept of politics, which is familiar to all the Brazilians and Westerners. Religion and the state are different. Yet, when believers are forced to choose, the answer you generally get is what 
Um, my Bible teacher told me once in class when I asked him about um, if Brazil was to outlaw something that they considered to be very dear to them. So the, he answered, uh, that's a good question, anthropologist. Mm -hmm. uh, we are, we're, going, we're all going to jail. Um, it's better to perish here than disobey God's word. So what underscores this is not um, that Pentecostals, that Pentecostals take which order they take to be more important only, but actually how this view resonates with the most views of politics, that politics is actually a relative category. Now that we have permission to redefine what politics is, I understand politics to concern to an array of actions that are not limited to the political. Following Carl Schmitt, I take the political to be one of the most distinctive features of political action that defines it, namely the, div the division between friend and enemy, or to put in Chantal Mouffe's terms, us versus them. In Schmitt's model, in which further developed by Mouffe, politics and the political are slightly different dimensions. The political is an intrinsic dimension to politics, which is a social relation manifested in the world. This model is particularly um, efficient in bringing to the fore one of, the Pente one of Pentecostal's most discussed features, which is its combative nature towards or rather against evil forces personalized in the devil. Yet, um, why are that believers understand building the kingdom as a commitment towards the pursuit of one's ministry in the church, this goal is simultaneously taken um, as in terms of fighting the devil and destroying evil. So be, building the kingdom is uh, akin to dismantling darkness. It is here that we see the distinction between the political and politics, this is where it becomes clear. Building the kingdom as a value implies devaluation of the kingdom of darkness and infuses advent Pentecostal ideology with a friend versus enemy dimension. In practice, it propels believers and church leadership to undertake a myriad of political actions, such as voting, supporting uh, Pastor Silas's public ministry and his close ties to political elites. Yes. Oh, I'm upset to go here. So this is um the church um usually three times a week where they had um so Sunday, um Tuesday and Thursday were like sort of the, the main, the most important services they held. So yeah, this is how packed it was. So if you want to pass there's a little bit more. Um, yeah, so this was actually one of the women's conference. So this was actually the conference that they were organizing uh, as uh, Dilma Rousseff was being impeached. So very important. Yes. So yes, so um, so it's basically there that we see this. So building the kingdom as a value implies the devaluation of the kingdom of darkness and therefore infuses Pentecostal, um, advent Pentecostal ideology with the friend versus enemy dimension. So in practice, what this does is to propel believers and church leadership to undertake a myriad of political actions, such as voting, uh, supporting Pastor Silas' ministry, public ministry, and his close ties with political elites. So within the realm of the church, this combative, uh, combative or political facet of building the kingdom is manifested in discourses like Pastor Silla's anti-communist message during a sermon or through evangel evangel evangelization and church um, expansion projects. So sometimes like they can be quite aggressive in the message as well. Um, so, um, but in addition to this, um, and I think that's sort of the most important part here, is that there is another dimension of what I mean by politics when we discuss uh, what's going on at ADVEC. So I take uh, MOVE 
moves conflict-oriented model again as a tool to analyze ADVEC's internal practices of political action. As I noted above, ADVEC believers conceive of the idea of ministries to be equally distributed to all, including non-believers. And these sort of ministries, they ought to be developed as a duty towards the kingdom of God. Among ADVEC believers, however, the distribution of ministries or gifts are not taken lightly as one could imagine. Besides all being called to serve God's kingdom, some ministries are more prestigious than others. Ministries are conversely both a source of equality, because everybody has got one, mm -hmm. but hierarchy. So discovering what is one's calling is not always an easy task. And people could spend as long as one year praying over the issue, hoping to receive guidance from God in revealing what one's life purpose in his kingdom actually is. So for those who discover um, their ministries to be filled with a pursuit of a secular career, working at the church is a much easier task. However, for those whose ministries are revealed to be church-based, so for example, being a pastor, being a singer, being an evangelist, pre preacher, um, a more preoccupying scenario actually emerges because great major uh, the great majority of Adivet believers feel that actually their ultimate mission is indeed to work at the church. Mm -hmm. Among men, especially, pursuing a pastoral career is often the most aspired goal. It's hard to find a male at Advec that doesn't dream of becoming a pastor, though exceptions do exist. Among women, the options are more diverse. Generally, women aspire to become wives of pastors. <laughs> Just saying. <laughs> and uh, but others would also would like to pursue a singing career at the church, and some aspire to become church department leaders, while um, others even dream of becoming famous um, Christian speakers. So they sort of want to become this sort of international celebrity. Mm -hmm. Um, and this was actually the case of my sort of closest informant. Um, we do have a picture of her mm -hmm. here. That's that's her. So we would to drive around a lot in Rio to sort of um, go. I would go with her to different branches of the same church while she preached. So um, she was protecting her gift. Yes. So. Um, with such, uh, with such aspirations in mind and the desire to serve in church through these kinds of ministries, both women and men at Advec seem often to, to be in competition amongst themselves, especially those who occupy positions at the same hierarchical level as the other. At Advec, the principle of equality states that all have a calling, but church hierarchy and the constraints of space cannot accommodate all. Taking this ethnographic reality into consideration, we are no longer speaking of an external us versus them based solely on cultural alterity. Mm. Instead, the political also pertains to the internal dynamics of conflict and competition that arise at times among fellow church members as they pursue their individual ministries within the church, church collect, collective space. Here, we're not only talking about the political as a dimension that is embedded in all social relations, as MOVE suggests, but we are referring to politics as a set of strategic ethical actions. Politics is then a set of actions in which individual and group interests are managed, imposed, dismissed, negotiated in, in, in light of the tensions and the ethical rules of the kingdom of God. By taking this approach, my interpretation is in dialogue with the so-called processual approaches in political anthropology. I take special consideration for the argument presented by Victor Turner in his seminal book, Schism and Continuity in an African Society, published in 1957. Although I do not follow Turner's claim that society should somehow uh, reach a state of equilibrium, I do accept his view that social relations are permeated by an intrinsic tension created by social asymmetry and individual interest. I also accept Turner's claims that people's relations either 
work towards resolution or management and even attenuation of conflict, or they will result in schism. In a nutshell, I understand politics to be a set of social practices that aim to transform the world and the self through the proper negotiation between individual and collective interest. This is particularly important for Pentecostals, where even the minimal conflict within churches can lead to schism and opening churches and lead to dissident uh, members actually opening churches and it gets even more fragmented. So in the case of Advent believers, for whom church unity is one of their highest values, politics is about the negotiation of individual and collective interests within this asymmetric social world of the church, where competitive gains arise, but all must abide to previously agreed, agreed rules and goals. One of them being the commitment to the unity of the city, similarly to what Plato, Aristotle, and even Augustine have laid out in their works about life in the polis. In this way, the model of politics I want to highlight here is not the one that's solely based on conflict, but the one in which the basis of conflict, the political, allows for strategic management of individual forms of action that seek to minimize conflict. Politics is about the strategic articulations to be undertaken for the good of the city. With this working model of politics, um, this is with this wor uh, working model of politics, what I call ethical political, are a body of social practices undertaken by and by Pentecostals with the goal to build the kingdom. On the one hand, believers bear the responsibility to bring this other uh, disorder to the world. And on the other, in order to carry out such dutiful tasks, believers uh, understand one must attune oneself with their individual pillows. To carry out building the kingdom is a teleological responsibility of a certain kind of person. One must do this in the world through politics. Put this way, the ethical political is not a mere confluence of ethics and politics, but it's the ethical practice realizing or that helps to realize um, action driven individual and collective political action. So the Last section here is uh, some concluding remarks. I sort of titled this concluding remarks or on the kingdom of God as a theoretical gap. So I hope uh, at this point I have um, established how a direct model of the kingdom of God is articulated and experienced as an ethical political individual and collective project. But before I conclude, it, I, con I, conclude it, I want to um, suggest a few po possible avenues that a serious comparison um, or that a serious comparative undertaking of this concept may lead us. So first, while there is a well-established literature on Christian megachurches, like the works undertaken by Simon Coleman, Tony Lerman, and on Elisha, to cite a few, the issue of institutional politics um, within megachurch is fairly unexplored. One exception is perhaps the work of Ilana Van White, on the church, the Universal Church of the Kingdom of God in South Africa. Mega churches are also interesting in the ways they challenge in puzzling ways some of the arguments proposed recently by a number of sociologists of religion who sustain that religion, especially Christianity, is becoming quickly deinstitutionalized. Second, a serious exploitation exploration and comparison of the ways in which Pentecostal Christians conceptualize and experience the kingdom of God may help us to understand how Pentecostalism grows and how patterns of circulation among believers across churches occur in different places. This, I posit, may bring to light some connections between religion and the economy, religion and politics, or even interdenomination dynamics that we may not yet know. Finally, one point of criticism against the now mature anthropology of Christianity is that it prioritizes the study of Protestantism over other Christian traditions, neglecting especially um, Roman Catholicism. And this was raised by uh, Valentina Napolitano recently. Um, so as an anthropology of Christianity studying Latin America, I take this point very, very seriously 
uh, Latin America is not only a religiously diverse region, mm -hmm. but um, this diversity falls greatly between Roman Catholicism and various forms of Protestantism. In Brazil, the situation is even more so, as it is nearly impossible to find pure Catholic enclaves. To understand Pentecostal political life in Brazil, I realized I had to understand how it developed and constantly resignifies itself in relation to the Catholic Church. From being a persecuted, from being a persecuted and labeled as a loud heretical sect, to becoming more recently a sorry, I'm just gonna start again. Sorry about that. Um, so from being a persecuted as as allowed um heretical sect in the early to mid 20th century to, a, to becoming a religious ideological ally more recently, Pentecostal politics has shaped the colonial, has been shaped by the colonial legacies of a politically imbued Roman Catholicism that shaped Brazilian society more widely. In what Brazilian scholar um, Gideon Delacar calls the ethos of persecution, Pentecostalism in Brazil developed as a discourse, uh, through a discourse and a self-identification as, as a persecuted minority. And as I have argued elsewhere, this was actually the first step toward developing a political ethics and a political theology. With the explosive growth of Pentecostalism in the mid-1970s and the economic development of the movement into a series of well-established churches, which operated following an authoritarian Episcopalian structure, despite lacking a central leading figure, Pentecostalism and Roman, and Roman Catholicism found themselves many times on common grounds, fighting the same enemies. For example, in what they both have recently labeled as communism, the Pentecostal Catholic Alliance, despite their many theological differences, come from two very similar views from these respective traditions. On the one hand, both of these traditions emphasize virtuous works as a way to achieve salvation. In the case of Pentecostalism, virtuous works guarantee that God's free, freely given salvation is not removed from the believer. Mm. Secondly, in both of these traditions, there is an emphasis on the importance of church governance and the role its role in changing society, as well as its necessity to defend itself from it. From Pentecost, from, from, for both Pentecostals and Catholics, the kingdom of God is represented by the church, and it is therefore the church's role to operate as some sort of ambassador for its virtues, values, and practices. Conversely, the first Protestant theology, Lutheranism, proposed a distinct model which the, there are two kingdoms, the kingdom of God transcended and yet to come, and the kingdom of mankind, which is handed by God, by God to humans without much of God's interference. By examining these traditions through the prism of their conceptualizations of the kingdom of God, we may further nuance the ways in which Christian political life emerges and how Protestant traditions may show a great degree of difference than it is often anticipated. This is crucial to understand how individual and grassroots politics are shaped in both Catholic and Pentecostal churches. In Latin America, the influence of liberation theology is a fundamental divide between Pentecostalism and Roman Catholicism. Yet, in examining these denominations in Brazil through their collective politics animated by their views of virtuous works and their understanding of the kingdom of God, one soon realizes that the conversion nature um, of their, uh, once soon realizes the converging nature of their political project. This is particularly important for understanding the current wave of religious nationalism that has swept Brazil in recent years under Bolsonaro. Right wing nationalism is also a Christian war, has become some sort of Christian war against communism, and the apparent heresies each group accused each other of in the past are now re-signified for the sake of the virtuous political work to defend the God's kingdom and in the nation. As a final point, I want to highlight the potential of the theological concept of the kingdom of God in affording a, um, a consideration of Christian politics beyond its relation to the state. 
Here I take inspiration on the recent works by Valentina Napolitano and Carlotta McAllister in their theoretical methodological proposal of a theopolitical analysis of politics. In a dialogue with history, political philosophy, and philosophy of religion, McAllister and Napolitano's the the theopolitical enterprise seeks to restore religious, the religious underpinnings of politics that has been long rejected by the social sciences. They argue that the compartmentalization of theology to the transcendent created a vacuum in capturing what they call the substance of politics, which they define as a theological sensoria through which performances by the living, the dead, and a host more than human entities are able to incarnate beyond uh, or in flight from their capture by the sovereign powers of the church and state. Invoking uh, the apophatic aspect of God, which is um, that aspect that cannot be named, they propose anthropologists um, work in order to search a gap between Theos, the strong conceptualized named God, and the logos and the logos of in the weak God, the unnamed and powerless God that withdraws from pronouncing himself. This ethnographic work on the gap between Theos and the apophatic God, as McAllister and Napolitan suggest, opens new possibilities for ethnographic exploration and the process through which human and more than human come in both union and disunion in political formations. Although the idea of a powerless withdrawing God would certainly fail to capture the cosmological models Advent believers have, I think the concept as a methodology is very fruitful to our study of the multifaceted forms of Christ Christian political life. It, it allows us to consider politics at, in the opaque, unseen, and untold formations of everyday life that despite all odds shape, are shaped by the theological categories and religious commitment, but are also rendered irrecognizable due to their in, everyday embodiedness. For example, while the church hierarchy at Advec is clearly seen as, manifest, as, a, as a manifestation or projection of the transcendent order emerging from the kingdom of God, the practice of gossip and competition for church posts is easily seen as a form of secular everyday politics by both informants and anthropologists alike. But if we just oppose McAllister and Napolitano's call to approach theology, not as a set of propositions, but as a matrix of affective and situated histories imbued with life forms and materialities, the space between everyday political forms and religious politics oriented by traditional theological concepts and models is approximated. In this way, while church gossip may differ from wider forms of political practice that entail clear engagement with religious discourse and categories, church gossip and competition are nonetheless a particular kind of religious politics. What renders it political, I argue, is not the religious context in which it is embedded, but the reason um, by which gossip and competition, despite their political, th their potential to disintegrate the church, are interpreted by church members as a kind of necessary evil for those committed to the kingdom of God. Many informants um, often mention how gossip and competition make them stronger preparing them to face the devil-dominated world that lies outside the church doors. In this way, these apparent non-religious forms of political life are nonetheless religiously orienting, meaning that they allow for the embodied experience of the kingdom of God, we find it both as an imperfect reality to the experience of earth through the church and as a better world that is yet to come, but which can be only experienced once the transcendent is fully made visible. Thank you. Oh, yes. There's more. Yeah. There's more slides. Yeah. So these um, two girls over here, Manu and Gabi, so the law of major and the psychology major I mentioned in the in the paper. Mm -hmm. And this was a protest, like an anti-abortion uh, protest. And that's me in one of the classrooms with all, with some of the women. 
one of the courses, many of the courses they have. Thank you. Thank you so much. This is a fascinating paper on, on a number of levels. And um, I mean, on the one hand, you 